Good morning, everybody. I'm Andrzej Proskurowski, the head of computer science department. And we're honored today to welcome Vint Cerf. Since his achievements are too long for me to remember, I, I will read them off uh, <laughs> my cheat sheet. Uh, success has many fathers, and, and Vint Cerf is known as one of the fathers of the internet. Uh, he is a co-designer of the TCP/IP protocol suit, and TCP stands for Transmission Control Protocol, and IP, of course, stands for Internet Protocol. And Vint is the vice president, and in uh, words that he coined himself, chief internet evangelist for Google. In this role, he's responsible for identifying new enabling technologies to support the development of advanced internet-based products and services from Google. He's also an active public face for Google in the internet world. <coughs> President Clinton presented the US National Medal of Technology to serve and his colleague Robert Kahn for founding and developing the internet. Kahn and Surf were named the recipients of the ACM Turing Award in 2004 for their work on the internet protocols. The Turing Award is sometimes called the Nobel Prize of Computer Science for the obvious reason that computer science wasn't around when Nobel established <laughs> his prize. <laughs> President Bush awarded Surf and Kahn the Presidential Medal of Freedom for their work. The medal is the highest civilian award given by the United States to its citizens. Surf is, among others, fellow of the IEEE, ACM, and American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the National Academy of Engineering. For uh, the purpose of brevity, I will not <laughs> list the more of honors bestowed on Vince Surf. This lecture is presented in collaboration with uh, the Network Startup Resource Center and the UFO Information Services, along with UFO Libraries. And now, uh, Dave, please, here is a place for you. <laughs> the president of the University of Oregon will greet it's well, fortunate that we had an extra spot. And now, without, oh, yeah, one more thing. The speakers are given token of appreciation, and I couldn't find, and, and apologies to Dave, a better for not giving him U of O book, but <laughs> I'll give him what I find the best well, at thank Oregon. Thank you very much. Oh, trips and trails in Oregon. Great. Hoping right. that Vince will be back. I'll, and I'll now, that over here. Vince right. Surf. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you all. Uh, first of all, I have to say that uh, when you stand up to begin speaking and people clap, my first reaction is to sit down because it's not going to get any better than that. So. <laughs> Uh, I actually have a bunch of things I want to do this morning. One of them, uh, I, I can't resist showing you a toy. Uh, this is uh, something that comes from Sony, and it just gives you a sense for what it's like to live in the 21st century. This is called the Sony Rolly. And have some of you seen this on YouTube already? Uh, it's a $400 piece of equipment. Now, uh, a friend of mine named uh, June Marai handed this to me in Dublin, Ireland at an IETF meeting. Uh, and I had to get back to the United States with it. And it's an expensive piece of equipment, so I put it in my carry-on luggage. You can imagine the reaction of the security <laughs> people when they saw this. And you know, they said, well, take that out. What is it? And, I, and you know, I put it down, and one of the guys was reaching over for it. And I wanted to say, don't touch that. And I thought, <laughs> probably a bad idea. Uh, OK, so this is actually a fancy music box. And let's see what it does. Hey guys, what's it called every time? I never get this right. There's a double click that you need to do to get it to work right, and I never get the double click right. Come on. 
Hey guys, what's it called every time we open our mouths and sing a song? We sing a... No! And what about the beat to the song? That's called the... <laughs> we got a little rhythm We got a little melody We put them both together We got a little song for you and me So clap your hands together Come on See how easy it can be Okay, that's all we really got time for, but you get an idea. <laughs> this thing is uh, programmable. It, you, you can download your own music to it. This, what you just saw is music that comes with it. Um, it uh, has, I don't know, eight or nine degrees of freedom. The, the little wheels will rotate in you know, either direction. Uh, the little wings will flap. Uh, the quality of the sound is not bad. Uh, they give you a program that you can use to choreograph this thing. And I haven't tried to do that. I'm sure it's hard. Uh, the thing that I was attracted to after just having fun and showing it to everybody uh, is that uh, it stays upright because the little wheels keep it above the surface of the table and it's quite maneuverable and quite precise. So I thought, okay, why don't I add a camera to this thing, a little video camera and a microphone. And then if I can't go to a meeting, I'll send this in my place. <laughs> and since it has a Bluetooth interface, you know, I can get a wireless connection to it. So you can imagine this little thing sitting on the table where I would normally be, you know, with a little camera. And it's listening to people talking. And if it decides that, or if I decide that I didn't agree with somebody, I would wheel my way around the table. <laughs> I think that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. <laughs> and I honestly believe that that would be very intimidating for everybody, you know, to have this little thing staring at you saying, well, so that's my next plan for this little gadget. All right. Now I guess I have to uh, convince Mr. Jobs that uh, I'm really at surf. Okay, so uh, let me start out by explaining my title. Actually, I didn't, I didn't ask for the title Chief Internet Evangelist. Uh, they asked me what title I wanted, and I said, how about um, Archduke? <laughs> and uh, that, that didn't go too well. Uh, the nomenclature of the company didn't match that. But they said, you know, why don't you be our chief internet evangelist? So I thought, okay, that's a great title, and I'll wear something ecclesiastical on my first day of work. This is actually the formal academic robes of the University of the Balearic Islands. And you have to understand that in Spain, uh, the uh, academic tradition comes out of uh, the church. And so the outfits really are very ecclesiastical with you know, lace sleeves and a cape and all this other stuff. So you don't get to wear this terribly often, but I thought it would be fun to wear it on my first day of work at, at Google. Okay, so let's go back in time. It's 1969. The Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency has decided it wants to experiment with packet switching because it wants to try that out as a way of doing computer communication instead of the traditional circuit switching. The uh, conventional wisdom of the time was that uh, packet switching wouldn't work. Uh, AT&T had no interest whatsoever in this technology. Uh, we said, would you like to participate in this? And they said, no, but we'll sell you dedicated circuits if you want to buy them or release them from us. So we did. And we built uh, the ARPANET, the predecessor to the internet. I was a graduate student at UCLA, and I wrote the software to connect the Sigma 7 computer to the first IMP, interface message processor, of the ARPANET. The Sigma uh, is in a museum somewhere, and some people think I should be there too, but uh, there it is. And the first packet switch looked like this. It was a, about the size of a refrigerator, uh, and it was encased in heavy metal. And in fact, it actually had four screw eyes on the top. The guys at the Bolt, Baronet, and Newman that built this uh, system knew that they were delivering it on a uh, Defense Department contract, and I guess they had imagined that it might be delivered by helicopter, you know, lowered down. <laughs> Uh, in, in place in some hostile territory. It actually ended up at UCLA surrounded by graduate students, and that's as hostile as anything I can think of, so <laughs> probably a good thing it was encased in heavy metal. 
Uh, the ARPANET was a very uh, successful experiment. It was demonstrated publicly in 1972. Uh, and uh, after the successful demonstration that packet switching actually worked and it was uh, low latency, very interactive, uh, the uh, team at DARPA said, well, if we're serious about using computers in command and control, we're going to have to find a way to put the computers on board mobile vehicles, aircraft, and ships at sea, and we can't use telephone wires to connect them together. You know, the tanks run over the wires and it doesn't work very well. So we had to switch to alternative technologies, radio and satellite in particular. So uh, a packet radio system was developed using uh, a spread spectrum radio developed by Collins uh, Radio in uh, Dallas, Texas. This is a, uh, uh, let me go here, these are cubic foot uh, radios that cost about $50,000 each. Uh, they were uh, operating at 1710 to 1850 megahertz. They were using direct sequence spreading, which is pretty advanced for the 1970s. They could generate anywhere from 100 to uh, 400 kilobits per second at about 10 watts of uh, radiated power. Uh, this nondescript looking bread truck was built by SRI International, which is where we deployed the packet radio for experimental purposes. The um, vehicle was driven around the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, occasionally stopping uh, to take detailed measurements of signal to noise ratio or packet loss or shot noise from cars, the generators on cars going by. Uh, there's a story about uh, the packet radio van pulling off the side of the uh, Bayshore Freeway uh, and the guy driving it was one of the engineers, so you know he got out and went to the back with everybody else. And so while they're taking all these various measurements, some police car comes by and they see this you know, nondescript, unmarked man sitting there with a stacked dipole or antenna up the top. So the policeman comes around, he knocks on the door, and you know the door opens up and he sees all these geeky guys in there with computer gear and radiometers and displays. And, and he says, who are you? And somebody inside says, uh, oh, we work for the government. <laughs> and he looks at him and he says, which government? <laughs> but officer, we were only going 50 kilobits per second. Right? <laughs> this too was a very successful experiment. It was a really hard problem though because the topology of the network kept changing as a function of time as the mobile vehicles moved around. We had radios uh, situated on the mountaintops in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area looking down to provide some connectivity, and then the other connectivity came from multiple vehicles that were in the area or on fixed installations that had packet radios on top. So that was a very successful experiment also, and it showed that packet switching could be made to work uh, in radio environments. So then we had to deal with the ships at sea problem, and, uh, oh, I'm sorry, one other thing I wanted to mention. Uh, at the time that we were doing this packet radio work, we were also very interested in sending not only data, but also voice through a packet switch system. So the packet radio van was outfitted with a uh, voice digitizer that took an ordinary voice stream, digitized it to 64 kilobits a second. The data rates that we had available, uh, as I say, were 100 to 400 kilobits a second, and in the ARPANET, only about 50 kilobits a second at the time. That was the backbone speed of that network back in the late 60s and early 70s. So you couldn't put a whole lot of 64 kilobit voice through uh, that narrow uh, backbone bandwidth. So we compressed the voice down using uh, a technique called linear predictive code with 10 parameters, which just meant that there was a voice track that you were modeling as a stack of 10 cylinders whose diameter would change as you were speaking. And then you would, uh, that little stack was excited by a formant frequency, which is the pitch of your voice. On the other, you just send the 10 parameters of the diameter plus the formant frequency to the other side at 1800 bits per second and the other side would invert that process and produce sound. So we, we were able to get uh, multiple voice streams through this relatively narrow bandwidth that way. The only problem is this particular uh, method of voice compression uh, lost a certain amount of quality uh, from the speech and it made anyone who spoke through it sound like a drunken Norwegian. <laughs> so the day came when I had to demonstrate this technology to some generals at the Pentagon and I remember thinking, okay, how am I gonna do this? And then I remembered that one of the participants in the program was Ingvar Lund. He was from the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment. <laughs> so we had Ingvar be the speaker. First we had him speak through the telephone system, then we had him speak through our packet voice system, and it sounded exactly the same. <laughs> so we didn't tell the generals that everybody would sound that way if they spoke through the system. A perfect demo. Okay, so 
that was, uh, that was the packet radio program. And then for ships at sea, uh, we uh, used a uh, satellite, you know, Sat 4A, which is in synchronous orbit over the Atlantic, linking uh, the western part of Europe to the eastern part of the United States. Uh, and in this system, we had a shared uh, common satellite channel with multiple ground stations, and they were dynamically sharing that, uh, that uh, single uh, channel by announcing what their communication requirements were, Aloha style, meaning basically you just announced whatever you needed. And if you heard your own announcement come down, then you know that it didn't conflict with anyone else. Uh, and it, everyone would listen for a while to everybody's requirements. And then uh, being in time sync, they would then calculate what the right schedule was so that you could actually do transmissions without collision. So this was called CPOTA, Contention Priority Oriented Demand Allocation, and it actually worked very well. So we had three different networks using packet switching technology, but they were all quite different in their delay rates, or their data rates, their delays, the packet sizes, error rates, and the like. Well, my colleague, Bob Kahn, who was running this program uh, at ARPA, came to Stanford University, my lab, in the spring of 1973, and showed me, uh, I'd worked on the ARPANET with him, but he showed me the packet radio and packet satellite systems, and he said, how are we going to get all these hooked together and make them look like it's just one uniform net so that no host on any one net uh, had to know very much, if at all, about all the different networks that were connected together that the traffic would have to pass through. That was the internet problem. We worked on it for about six months and wrote a paper, which was published in May of 1974, describing what the internet would look like. Uh, and then by December of 74, my team at uh, Stanford University wrote the first full spec of TCP. So by 1975, we started doing uh, experimental implementations of TCP and eventually TCP IP. We split off the internet protocol from TCP in order to support more real-time kinds of applications, whether it was voice uh, communication or video or maybe radar tracking. So by 1977, we were ready to test the full three network system. And by this time, I was uh, uh, in the Defense Department running the program uh, from DARPA. So this particular test was an important one because it, it was uh, a kind of proof of concept that this basic TCP IP architecture would allow these three different kinds of nets to interwork in a very transparent way. So we had the Bayshore uh, uh, van driving up and down, radiating traffic, sending packets destined for USC Information Sciences Institute in Marina del Rey, 400 miles to the south. But we modified the gateways between the networks so that the routing actually sent the traffic all the way into the ARPANET across the ARPANET through an internal satellite hop that ended up in Norway and then by landline down to University College London. Back out of the ARPANET through a gateway to the packet satellite net, back up to a synchronous uh, link uh, on uh, Intelsat 4A, down to ECAM West Virginia, uh, through another gateway and back into the ARPANET all the way across the country and then down to Marina del Rey. Well, the packets were effectively only going 400 miles, but if you actually calculate how far the packet went, it was more like 100,000 miles. Now, it worked. And I have to tell you that we were leaping around saying, it works, it works, you know, as if it couldn't possibly have worked. Uh, it, it, this is all software, and anybody who knows anything about software knows it's a miracle when any software works at all, so we were pretty excited. Uh, I made this, drew this picture, and I had it framed, and I sent it to uh, George Hallmeyer, uh, the then head of DARPA, and I said, you know, dear George, I don't think we wasted our money on this one. It actually worked. So if we fast forward uh, a few years uh, and look at the internet as it looked in 1999, this is a topological image of the connectivity of the internet built, uh, put together by Bill Cheswick, who was at Belcor. Uh, and what you're seeing really is uh, different colors represent different networks, and they're interconnected in this fairly complex way. Uh, about all you can tell from this kind of a picture is that the network got bigger and it got more uh, connected and it got more colorful. And uh, I think I, that's a good description of the internet uh, today. So if we look at today, or nearly today, we can see some interesting statistics. There are over a half billion machines that are visible on the public internet. Uh, there are a lot more machines that are not visible on the public internet because they're hiding behind firewalls. They're in, uh, there could be institutions here. There could be businesses that uh, try to protect their uh, resources by firewalling them from the rest of the public net. So this is, these are just machines that have domain names and fixed IP addresses that, that we can see in public. 
there are almost a billion and a half users as of the middle of the year. And in the same general time frame of about a decade, all, over 3 billion mobiles have entered into uh, the telecom market. And that's actually having a big impact on the internet because a lot of the mobiles are internet enabled. And so more and more people are using mobiles to get access to the internet. And in fact, it's so prevalent now, especially in the developing world, that uh, we believe at Google that many people will have their first interaction with the internet through a mobile and not through a laptop. And that's actually important to us because uh, these mobiles are challenges, right? They're, um, for one thing, they have displays that are the size of a uh, 1928 television set, and they have a keyboard that's suitable for people that are three inches tall. <laughs> So uh, there's some challenge to make your applications work in such a small display area. One of the things that I'm very attracted by is the possibility that these devices are not used alone. In other words, instead of just sitting here with your little laptop and struggling to deal with a small display, imagine that when you walk into a room like this, uh, that that projection unit is detectable by the mobile uh, using Bluetooth or maybe some other 802.11 uh, application. And it now knows that there's an alternative way of presenting information. And so we could take, take advantage of that and use the projector. Or when you walk into a hotel room where you see these large, uh, high-resolution displays, uh, your mobile could make use of that as well. And if, if it happens to have a web TV keyboard available, you, you could discover that. And so the idea is that the mobile becomes one of a collection of devices that is servicing your requirements and you're not constrained only to use the laptop or only to use the mobile. Uh, and when you're trying to interact with the net. Okay, here's the distribution of users on the net. Now, if I were giving this presentation 10 years ago, the largest contingent of users would have been in North America. But what you see here is that Asia is by far the largest uh, grouping of users on the net. And at, and at that, at a very low penetration of only 15%. So when they reach the same degree of penetration of internet in their population as we have in North America, that number will be in the billions. Uh, China has an estimated 253 million users. The United States has an estimated 240 million users. If you do the math, the Chinese are ahead of the United States now in terms of absolute numbers of users on the internet, and of course that will continue uh, to escalate. Europe has, is the next largest grouping, almost 400 million users, although I make no predictions about Europe anymore because they keep adding countries, so I can't define, you know, what, what is Europe? You know, the answer is, you know, ask tomorrow, you know, you'll get a different answer. Uh, the reason that I want you to see these is that um, it tells you that the English language, North American-centric internet is changing. And as time goes on, more and more of the users will be from other cultures, speaking other languages, expecting other kinds of information on the net in addition to what's already there. Uh, and so anyone who is interested in providing services on the network needs to be aware that it is a global phenomenon with a much a growing, rapidly growing and much larger population of non-English speakers, uh, or at least non-native English speakers. And so this, uh, this is an important part of anybody's thinking of developing new products and services. The rest of the um, statistics are as you see them. Africa is an enormous challenge. There are almost a billion people on that continent, only about 5% of whom are estimated to have access to the internet. Uh, and here's an opportunity to plug something that's going on here at the University of Oregon. The Network Startup Resources Center, which Steve Hooter runs, has been extremely active in trying to expand access to the internet in continents like Africa or in the Middle East or uh, Latin America where the internet uh, has not yet penetrated and so this is probably one of the most valuable activities uh, at the university from my very narrow perspective with regard to internet evangelism because um, the way I look at it only 22 percent of the world is online I have 80 percent to go and I need help and thanks to Steve and his team I'm getting some. This is just a picture of how rapidly the growth of hosts on the network, visible hosts, has been. And, and you can see that it's not growing as quickly as it did in the mid-1990s. The reason for that is not that the growth has slowed down, it's just that it's hidden. And most of the growth is, is behind the firewalls. Uh, you can see, uh, similarly, uh, this is a linear chart. Uh, and you can see there's still a very rapid visible growth of hosts on the network, which uh, dictates another problem. Uh, this chart is important only because of the uh, line that's going down 
that's the amount of available internet uh, address space uh, in IP version 4, which is what everybody's using today, as uh, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, which is part of the Internet Corporation for Assigned n uh, Names and Numbers, is responsible for allocating blocks of IP addresses to users in the Internet, and uh, specifically to the uh, regional Internet registries, who then hand address space off to Internet service providers. That the available space is dropping rapidly, and we will have exhausted the IPv4 address space somewhere around mid-2010. Uh, that's because there's only 32 bits worth of, of unique address space. Uh, and that's my fault. Uh, I actually <laughs> made the decision in 1977 after a year of argument uh, with a bunch of engineers who were participating in the design of the Internet over how big should the Internet address space be. Well, at the time, uh, you know, it was still an experiment. We didn't know how well it was going to work. Uh, and I thought, you know, 4.3 billion addresses ought to be enough for an experiment. Uh, there was an argument for variable length, but the programmers didn't like it because of the problem of finding fields in a variable length format, so that went away. Some people argued for 128 bits of address space, but I just couldn't see standing up and trying to explain to some congressman why I needed 3.4 times 10 to the 38th addresses to do an experiment. So we ended up with 32 bits, and I actually thought that what would happen is if the test was successful, and if we were able to show this was a uh, viable technology, that we would then implement a production version. Well, that's not what happened. The experiment didn't end. And here we are today, it's 2008, we're running out of address space. So, we're going to have to move to IP version 6. If any of you are counting, you'll notice we somehow skipped over IP version 5. That was an experiment in streaming audio and video that didn't work out. So we abandoned that version, and we went on to the next one, which is V6. Uh, that's, that was standardized in 1996, but nobody implemented it very much. And uh, now, of course, we're clearly running out. And people are starting to scramble to uh, implement IPv6. Uh, that's a lot of address space. That's 340 trillion, trillion, trillion addresses. And I used to go around saying that's enough address space so every electron in the universe can have its own web page. Uh, and then somebody sent me a note from Caltech, and he said, Dear Dr. Surf, you jerk, there's 10 to the 88th electrons in the universe, and you're off by 50 orders of magnitude. <laughs> so I don't say that anymore. <laughs> I am very proud, though, to tell you that Google has implemented IP version 6. Uh, it's still working on getting all of our products and services up on the new protocol in parallel with the IPv4. But if you happen to be on a V6 access uh, system, and you go to ipv6.google.com, you'll actually see uh, an animated Google logo, which is the way we inform you that you got there by IPv6 instead of IPv4. There are a lot of issues here associated with implementing parallel protocols that are not interoperable in the Internet. For one thing, you have to run two different routing algorithms. Uh, you have to double the routing table size in gross terms. Uh, you have the problem of uh, a, a relatively immature network management technology for IPv6 and a relatively mature one for IPv4. And you know, you'll, when things go wrong, you'll be getting error messages from both parts of the system, and you have to sort all that out. Uh, the other big problem we have is that in the original ARPANET, I'm sorry, in the original Internet, there were two core networks in the United States, the ARPANET and the National Science Foundation network. And they were interconnected, and they were running IP version 4. So if you connected to any of those nets with an IP version 4 system, you were connected to everybody. So you started with a connected core, and you kind of grew outward. IPv6 is being implemented piecemeal. And so just because you implement IPv6 doesn't mean you're connected to anyone else that's implementing IPv6. So you end up with this disconnected, fragmented IPv6 network. That's not acceptable. We need to institute peering policies that will create a connected IPv6 system as early as possible so that we can grow smoothly uh, and connectedly as opposed to having to do awful things like tunneling IPv6 through IPv4, which is a very brittle way of linking the V6 components together. I want to talk a little bit more about mobiles just to give you some sense for what's happening in, in this domain. Uh, these are not just telephones, as you all know. I mean, they are programmable devices. I think of them as little receptacles waiting for somebody to pour some more software in so they can do something new. Uh, and in fact, uh, at Google, uh, we just released an operating system called Android, which you can see here on the laptop. Uh, Android is intended to be an open operating system that people can use 
to run uh, mobile platforms. On October 22nd, the first Android-based mobile will come out. It's called the G1, and it's coming from T-Mobile. Um, the idea here was to create a platform that other people could add to, could put new applications on, uh, could download them in real time and run them. Uh, people are using these things for a variety of applications, not just access to the, to the web or texting back and forth, but payment systems. In fact, there are some uh, mobile systems that are being used to transfer minutes from one mobile to another as a means of payment. So if you didn't have a checking account, but you had a mobile with minutes, you could use the minutes as a medium of exchange. So it's amazing the kinds of things that people invent uh, to use app, you know, applications that they invent for devices like this. One of the things that uh, we've noticed is that a lot of these devices either have GPS receivers in them so the device knows where it is, or you can triangulate approximately where it is by knowing uh, which of the base stations are within radio range. And so our uh, Google Maps application on mobiles, in fact, uses the radio ranging method if, it, if GPS information isn't available. What we've noticed about people using these mobiles when they're asking questions of, of uh, the Google uh, search engine is that their questions are often geographically specific. So you'll find people saying, where's the nearest ATM machine, or where's the nearest gas station, or where's the nearest restaurant? That's not a well-formed question unless the host machine on the other end also knows where are you when you're asking that question. So you can easily imagine that this information might flow to that host automatically from the mobile if the mobile actually knows where it is. And I sort of appreciated that this meant that geographically indexed information is valuable, but I didn't viscerally understand it until my family went on a vacation to Lake Powell in Arizona. There's a little town called Page, Arizona. It's the beginning of this big, long lake system. And so as we were driving into Page, Arizona, we're planning to rent a houseboat. And somebody said, you know, after we get out on the lake, there's no grocery stores. So you better, you know, buy all your provisions before you get on the boat. So then we started talking about what should we make uh, for meals on the boat. Somebody said, why don't we make paella? And I remember thinking, gee, that's a wonderful idea. I love paella, but uh, you, you know, where am I going to find saffron in Page, Arizona? So uh, I said, well, I had a good GPRS signal, so I went out to my Google homepage uh, on my mobile and I typed Saffron Page, Arizona grocery store. And three grocery stores popped up with little maps to show how to get there and a telephone number. So I clicked on the phone number on one of them and the phone rang and a voice answers and I said, may I speak to the spice department, please? Now, this is probably a little store, and it's probably the owner of the store, and he says, uh, this is the spice department. <laughs> and I said, well, do you have any saffron? And he said, I don't know, but I'll go look. So he goes off, and he comes back, and he says, yep, I've got some. So we follow the map in real time, and we get to the store, and I run in, and I buy $12.99 worth of saffron. That's .06 ounces, in case you care. <laughs> uh, and I, afterwards, as I'm walking back to the car, I thought, no, oh, that's really interesting, because I just got exactly the information that I needed it when I needed it, and it was relevant, as opposed to looking for saffron and being told you can get it in New York City 1,500 miles away. So my respect for geographically indexed information went up uh, pretty noticeably as a consequence of that little uh, interaction. So I want to talk a little bit about other things that are starting to show up on the net in addition to things like personal digital assistance. Over the 30 years that I've been involved, I've seen things go on the net that I never anticipated. We used to tell jokes about toaster net. You know, we used to say, wouldn't it be funny if someday somebody put a toaster up on the internet and kind of controlled it remotely by sending SNMP packets to say how burned you wanted your toast. In fact, somebody actually did that. There used to be a very uh, popular uh, convention exhibition called Interop, and they always had a, kind of an operating internet in the, in the show, on the show floor, and one guy actually did instrument his toaster, and you could go send a command to it. So we really did have a toaster net. And it was a joke, but now we have refrigerators that are online and have nice liquid crystal displays with such sensitive panels. Uh, picture frames are on the net, and they have the nice property that they just run. You don't have to boot up Windows or log in or anything. And every 24 hours or whatever interval you set, it will wake up, make a connection through the internet to a website, down <coughs> download uh, images that it's been told uh, to, uh, to use, throw away some that it's uh, already used, uh, maybe put up some captions and then cycle through the imagery. So I have a bunch of these in my family 
are scattered around in living rooms and, and uh, bedrooms and so on. We all upload our family pictures to this website and the little picture frames wake up and they download the images and you can sort of have a look and see what the family's been up to, watch the nieces and the nephews and the grandchildren growing up. So that's all very cool, except for one potential hazard. Uh, if anybody hacks a website that these things are downloading from, the grandparents may see pictures that they hope are not of the grandchildren. <laughs> so this suggests that uh, if you're interested in security, it's just as important at home as it is at work. There are things that look like telephones that are really voice over IP devices. Uh, and then there's this guy in San Diego who built an internet-enabled surfboard. Uh, all, I, and I haven't met him, so I don't know exactly how this happened, but I have a kind of a fancy scenario in my head. He's sitting out on the water thinking, gee, while well, I'm waiting for the next wave, if I had a laptop and my surfboard, I could be surfing the internet while I'm waiting to do this other thing. <laughs> so he built a laptop into the surfboard. He put a Wi-Fi server back at the rescue shack. And now he sells this as a product. So if you're interested in surfing the internet on a surfboard, you know, you know where to go. Uh, I'm predicting that there will be literally billions of devices on the internet. Most of them will be programmable in high-level languages like Java and Python. Some you see, like the ones you, see, you go into a hotel room, you see the web TVs and things, or kids with video games that are internet-enabled, they're talking to each other you know, with headsets while they are playing the, the video games. Uh, the refrigerator is kind of interesting. I mean, once you have a nice display and everything, you can augment the American family communication system, which is mostly magnets and paper, you know, on the front of the refrigerator. Now you can have blogs and uh, email and maybe a web page or two. Um, but I think it would be more interesting if uh, we had RFID chips on the stuff that goes into the refrigerator in an RFID detector, because then the refrigerator would know what it has in it. And while you're working, it's surfing the internet looking for recipes that match up with what it has inside. So when you come home, you can see a list of things you could make for dinner. Now, that sounds kind of cool, actually. And then, let's see, you could extrapolate this. Uh, you might be on vacation, and you get an email, and it's from your refrigerator. <laughs> and it says, you know, I don't know how much milk is left, but you put it in there three weeks ago, and it's going to walk out on its own if you don't do something. <laughs> or uh, maybe you're shopping, and your mobile goes off. It's an SMS from your refrigerator. Don't forget the marinara sauce. I have everything else I need for spaghetti dinner tonight. You know, the Japanese have done a bad thing to us, though, because they've invented an internet-enabled bathroom scale. And you, know, you step on the scale, and it figures out which family member you are based on your weight. Uh, and then it sends that information to the doctor to become part of your medical record. But, you know, that's OK. I mean, that's not so terrible. The only problem is that the refrigerator is on the same network. <laughs> uh, so you know, when you come home, you see diet recipes coming up on the display. <laughs> or you know, maybe it just refuses to open. You know? <laughs> yeah. uh, there are a lot of other things here. But the, the, in your introduction, uh, you mentioned the Nobel Prize and, and the fact that you can't get the Nobel Prize for computer science. This disturbed me no end. Uh, there, there is a, a possibly apocryphal reason for this. Uh, it, it was rumored that uh, Mr. Nobel's wife ran away with a very good mathematician <laughs> and that he declared to the Nobel Prize Committee that they should not spend any of his money on any branch of mathematics because he was afraid that this guy might actually get the prize. So since computer science is often considered a branch of mathematics, we're you know, foreclosed from having the Nobel Prize. So I thought, OK, well, we've got to do something about this. So I thought, well, all right, how about a quantum theory, a new quantum theory that you know, we could present to the physics people. So I have a new quantum theory, um, and it involves internet-enabled wine corks. Um, uh, you, you remember Schrodinger's trying to explain the fact that quantum particles could be in more than one state at the same time? And he had this little idea that was called Schrodinger's cat. And he said, you know, suppose you had a box, and you put a cat in the box, and you put a little capsule of cyanide in there, and inside of which is maybe a, a little piece of radium, and then you seal up the box. Now, if the radium emits an alpha particle and it breaks the capsule, the cyanide is released and it kills the cat. No cats were harmed. This is a Gedanken experiment. Uh, and so the question is, when the box is all sealed up, what's the state of the cat? And the answer is, you don't know. It could be alive or dead, and you have to treat it as both until you open up the box and look inside. A bottle of wine is just like that. You know, while it's all corked up and everything, it could be absolutely horrible or it could be absolutely terrific or anything in between. And you have to treat it as if it has all possible values of good and bad until you pull the cork. So um, this is sort of a gigantic 
quantum theory, and I'm going to write all that up and send it to the Nobel Prize Committee and see whether I can't persuade them that that's worthy of recognition. Uh, in the meantime, one could imagine uh, instrumenting the wine cork to keep track of the uh, state of the wine bottle. You know, uh, what temperature is it at, what's the humidity, and when was it put in the bottle, and how long has it been there, and what was the location. And then before you open the wine, you interrogate the wine cork to find out what the history of the bottle is. <clears throat> and, you know, if it turns out that it reached a temperature of 102 degrees on July 4th, 2004, that's the one that you give to a friend who doesn't know the difference between good and bad wine. <laughs> okay, so uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to the last bullet here, which is sensor networks. More and more, we're starting to see sensor systems become part of the Internet environment. So things that are gathering data and making them available online, and I want to give you an example of that. It's assuming I can get this thing's attention. And we are online at my house in uh, Woodhurst in uh, Northern Virginia. This is an IPv6 network running on an 802.15.4 Zigbee wireless network. Uh, there are 12 sensors, uh, and there are the little blue dots up here. I know that's an eye chart for everybody. This is hard to do if you're looking back there. Uh, so here's bedroom one, bedroom two, bedroom three, bedroom four, and so on. These are sensors that are picking up uh, temperature, humidity, and light levels. And they're reporting that information every five minutes. And it's being collected through a couple of routers to a host down in my basement called Einstein. So uh, we're online in real time right now picking up this information. Uh, if, if you're interested in how uh, cleverly this network is built, this is a commercial network, by the way. It comes from a company called Artrop. Uh, if we look at the chart view, or map view of this, here you're seeing a whole bunch of little lines and everything. That's the radio uh, connectivity among these various little sensors. So the sensors are not only picking up information, but they're also storing and forwarding the data. So it's a self-organizing network. Um, the uh, important part, of course, is the data that's, uh, that's coming in uh, from the system. Uh, here we're seeing uh, the temperature uh, all around the house here. Let's see. Yesterday, we detected one bedroom that was 81 degrees, and we were wondering what was going on in there. Uh, this looks like they, uh, my wife has 20 women who are uh, visiting for a week in the house, and uh, it looks like they must be, uh, they're visiting the White House today. So these are pretty nice temperatures, actually, 71, 73, and then 57.9 degrees in the wine cellar. That's important. 81% humidity, that's also important. So if we actually looked at what's going on in the wine cellar, uh, what we would see is the humidity is ranging between 80.5 and 81.5%. Uh, the light levels go from 0 to 18 lux uh, by one sensor, and another one shows 0 to 3. And the temperature has dropped from 58 to 57.6. Uh, there's a spike over here. This is a 24-hour view. I, you know, maybe somebody opened the wine cellar. This one of the things I'd like to know is if anybody got into the wine cellar when I wasn't there. Um, you know, and but somebody has pointed out to me that uh, I really need to do a better job of instrumenting things. What I should do is put uh, RFID uh, chips on the wine bottles, and then have an RFID detector inside the wine cellar, so I could tell if any bottles leave the wine cellar without my permission. And, but someone else has pointed out to me that somebody could go into the wine cellar and drink the wine and leave the bottle there, in which case I wouldn't notice. So this gets back to the instrumented wine cork, and I have to, not only do I have to know whether the bottle is there, but I have to know if there's anything in it. And as long as I'm going, you know, instrumenting the wine cork, I might as well put in a chemical sensor to see which esters are present and whether or not the bottle has reached the point where it's time to, uh, to consume it. And as I say, if I detect that this is one whose temperature has gotten out of control, I'll give that one away to uh, somebody who doesn't know the difference. So that's what's going on in the sensor world, and I get very excited about the possibilities. Oh, there is one other uh, story here. Um, it, the system is designed to alarm, um, send me a, a, a mobile message if the temperature rises above 60 degrees, and it did that about a month ago when I was at Argonne National Laboratory for three days. Uh, my mobile went off and the cooler had failed, and so I started getting messages every hour saying, your wine is uh, heating up. And I couldn't uh, get back for three days, and my wife was off in Russia somewhere on a trip. So uh, the wine kept warming up, and I kept every hour getting told that, you know, you needed to do something. 
these, uh, this, this particular Arthrox system does have an actuator capability in addition to data gathering, and so my next step is to put in an actuator so I can remotely uh, turn on uh, the cooling system if it happens to fail. Now, authentication is really important here because uh, I don't want the 15-year-old next door to reprogram my wine cellar while I'm away. So it's, it's clear that I have to make sure that it's only me or some other authorized party that, that uses this technology. Okay, so let's go back to our regularly scheduled program here. Um, I just want to uh, very quickly, I want to allow some time for some Q&A here. So uh, let me just quickly say that there are some fairly major changes coming to the Internet uh, in this next year or so. One of them is to digitally sign the zone files of the domain name system so as to defend against people who try to fool you into going to the wrong place on the net. By digitally signing the zone files, when you do a lookup, you can ask for a digitally signed answer and you can validate that the information that you got back is the same as what was originally put in there, that nobody has modified uh, the uh, response coming back, which has become a problem in some uh, places in the net. Another thing which is happening is that the domain names themselves, which have been expressed in Latin characters for many years, are about to be expressible in characters other than Latin characters. So uh, Korean and Chinese and Japanese and Cyrillic and uh, Arabic and Hebrew and so on are all going to be permitted as ways of expressing domain names. And that leads to a lot of challenges. Uh, it's it's uh, sometimes possible to confuse one letter for another. For example, Greek and Latin uh, and, um, and Cyrillic all have letters that, uh, that look the same. They're not identical, but some of them look the same. Or they're confusable, like the R that looks backwards in, uh, in Cyrillic compared to Latin. Uh, or an A, which looks the same in all three, Latin, Greek, and Cyrillic. So you can imagine, you know, registering a domain name with a uh, Cyrillic A instead of a Latin A, and it looks the same to the human eye, and so you click on there and you go to the wrong place, in effect. That's uh, a serious kind of fishing and farming. And so we're, as we introduce this stuff, we're trying to do it in a way that minimizes the potential for this kind of confusion. Now, normally when I'm on a campus like this, uh, I try to point out that there's a whole lot of opportunity for future research uh, in developing new capabilities on the Internet. We have not done a very good job of dealing with mobility. Anyone who's ever tried to deal with mobile IP will recognize that. We don't do multi-homing very well at all. If you're connected to two different ISPs, you get two different Internet addresses, and it, it, if you can't get the same connection going through both of those ISP paths at the same time because the TCP connections are different. Uh, so we need a layer of end-to-end -end identifiers that are distinct from the IP addresses that are topologically significant. That would be an easy protocol to develop, and it's something that should be tested. Uh, similarly, when we do routing through the network, we typically only pick one path until it doesn't work anymore, and then we pick another one. Instead of using multiple paths to get increased capacity between source and destination uh, in the systems. Uh, we don't use broadcast technology very well at all. In fact, we take broadcast technology and turn it into a point-to-point -point link. So when we take uh, Wi-Fi, for example, uh, we actually radiate uh, in such a way that lots of receivers could hear what we said, but we turned it into only one other receiver is supposed to pay attention to what we did. I keep thinking, you know, there are a lot of applications where lots of people want to get the same thing. It could be mapping information, it could be download of the latest version of software of some widely popular uh, piece of, uh, of application. It could be a movie that a lot of people want to get. You can imagine having a satellite that's, that's raining internet packets down on a large number of receivers. If the protocols were adapted to take advantage of a broadcast capability, we could augment the functionality of the internet in some pretty dramatic ways. Nobody's doing that. And it seems to me that uh, for those of you who are interested in research in this area, there are some really wide open opportunities to uh, add functionality. Uh, by the same token, we don't do a very good job of strong authentication. Right now, it's a little hard to tell where did this email come from. Sometimes it's hard to know which host did I end up on. Is it really the one I thought I was supposed to be talking to? Uh, what, do we, what do I do with digital signatures? Can I tell uh, if this document is, in fact, from the party I expected it to come from? How do I deal with the fact that the Internet is global in scope and people commit abuses on it? Fraud, bullying, uh, you know, things, all kinds of various um, uh, let's say socially and uh, antisocial behaviors. And we don't have uh, common rules right now 
for dealing with those problems. A, a victim may be in one jurisdiction and the perpetrator in another, and we don't have an international law of the net to allow uh, multilateral enforcement of certain kinds of, uh, of uh, to prevent or at least to punish antisocial behavior. And so my prediction is that we're going to have to develop a law of the net in the same way that we had to develop a law of the sea to have international agreement on at least some of the improper or unacceptable practices on the network. I'm going to skip through this because I'm running out of time here. Um, let me just mention uh, one thing about IPTV. A lot of people, when they talk about video on the internet, usually think about streaming video. That's actually hard on the net because you have to get every packet to show up at exactly the right time or the video and audio will break up. But as we move into a regime where there's much, much higher data rate uh, than typically in the United States, and if we're, if we're in uh, Japan, we can get gigabit per second service for about 8,700 yen a month. Uh, when you're up in those data rates, you can deliver video faster than real time. And that's exactly what you do with an iPod today. You download the music faster than you would listen to it. And the interesting thing is that once you're into that mode, then video on demand is no longer a streaming video. It's just a file transfer. And for people who are interested in network engineering, file transfers are so much easier on the network than streaming. For one thing, it doesn't matter if they don't arrive quite exactly at the same time. It doesn't matter if you lose a few, you just retransmit them. It doesn't matter if they come out of order, you put them back in order when you do the, uh, assemble the file. And then you simply play it back whenever you want to. So this is sort of the Internet's version of TiVo or personal video recording. It's my prediction that as we move to higher and higher speeds, if we get there in the United States, that people who are interested in using the Internet for the video medium will move away from streaming and move towards downloading and playing back. If you watch YouTube today, you're almost there because if you watch the download of the YouTube, usually it's going faster than the display is playing it back. And, and even there, we're only at fairly low data rates of you know, 1 to 10 megabits a second. Uh, the other thing which is interesting about this I, IPTV idea where file transfers are the norm uh, is that you can also download things slower than real time. So if you don't mind waiting for it, you just run it in the background and when the video is downloaded as a file, you play it back. This is sort of like Netflix. You know, you order something on Netflix, it takes three days to get there. But you don't mind because, you know, first of all, you know that. And second, convenience is nice. You just clicked on, on the website and said, I want this movie, this movie, this movie, and then a few days later it pops up in your mailbox. Incidentally, if you didn't do the math, you should try it. I talked to Reed Hastings, the guy that did uh, Netflix, and I asked him two years ago, how many of these things are you putting into the postal system every day? And he, two years ago, it was 1.9 million DVDs a day. If you go home and do the homework, it's 7.4 gigabytes per DVD times uh, you know, 1.9 million divided by 84,400 seconds. You actually get a very respectable data rate out of the Postal Service, which is <laughs> pretty incredible. Uh, I get very interested in uh, this notion of downloading files with video content because like a DVD, uh, it can have more than just video on it. It can have a book associated with the movie, you can have the biographies of the actors and the director, you could have a program, that the, a game that might be associated with the movie, and it could have advertising. But the kind of advertising that we could do with this kind of video download and playback is different from what the typical television industry does. The television industry puts in intrusive advertising that we all hate, and if we're using TiVos, we skip over it. And the advertisers know that, they don't like this very much. In uh, the world that I live in, we're expecting to be able to interact with the things we see on the screen. So imagine that on the screen is a, uh, you know, the uh, logo of a, a, no, it's a Mac, you know, just sitting here in the middle of the field of view. If I mouse over that and click on it, a window could open up. And it could say, gee, I see that you're uh, looking at the Macintosh. This is the MacBook Pro. Uh, oh, I see you're online now. Uh, there's an Apple store six blocks away. Uh, they have six of these in inventory. Would you like to buy one now? Click here. Now, what's happened is that the user has decided whether he or she is interested in some information about what's in the field of view rather than being forced to look at an advertisement. And our experience with uh, text advertising in the Google search world suggests that users will be more responsive to that kind of opportunity than they are to the intrusive kind of ads. Okay, uh, I'm going to skip over to one final uh, prepared uh, report. 
uh, one preface here, this is not a Google project that I'm about to tell you about, so I don't want you to leave the room and say you just figured out that Google's business model is to take over the solar system. That's not what this is about. <laughs> this is about a project that got started at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory 10 years ago in 1998. The basic idea was to augment the kind of communication that's used for space exploration with some richer networking capability. Mars is a place that we've been kept coming back to uh, to explore along with the other planets and asteroids of the solar system. We've been using something called the Deep Space Network that was built in 1964 with 70 meter dishes in Canberra, Australia, Goldstone, California, and Madrid, Spain, talking to uh, spacecraft that are in orbit around the planets or flying past the asteroids or sometimes landing on the surface like the rovers did in 2004. Those rovers, by the way, were originally designed to last 90 days and they've been going for four years now. One of them, I forget whether it's Spirit or Opportunity, has a broken wheel and it's sort of, and so they're steering it backwards and it's dragging a little furrow in the <laughs> Martian soil as it kind of limps along. Uh, these things were originally intended to transmit the data that they were collecting straight back to Earth to the big deep space 70 meter dishes. But when they turned that radio on, it overheated. Now, the original design called for a 28 kilobit per second data rate going back to Earth. So now the radios overheat and the uh, engineers said, well, we have to reduce the duty cycle of the radio. Now the scientists are going crazy because they're, not only were they not getting a whole lot of data back at 28 kilobits, now they're not going to get as much as they thought. And the engineers at JPL said, well, wait a minute, we have another radio on board. And it goes at 128 kilobits a second. The trouble is it can only get up to you know, a satellite in orbit. It can't go all the way back to Earth. So they said, well, we got four satellites in orbit around Mars right now. Uh, they were used to map the surface of the planet to decide where the rover should go. But they finished that mission, but they're still there. They still have power, computing, and storage, and, and radios. So why don't we reprogram the orbiters to take the data from the uh, rover on the ground and hold on to it and then transmit it after you get to the right point in your orbit back to the deep space network. So that's store and forward networking. Well, that's the beginnings of the idea of building a kind of interplanetary internet, except my colleagues and I had already started thinking about that about uh, almost uh, six years before this particular thing was done. And in fact, when the uh, Phoenix lander arrived in May of this year, it was designed to run the store and forward mode deliberately because they realized they could get more data back that way than they could using the other alternative. Um, so uh, what we did originally uh, when we were thinking about extending the internet across the solar system was to try and figure out if we could use the standard TCP IP protocols. That idea lasted about an hour. Uh, the first problem we noticed is that the distance between the planets is literally astronomical. <laughs> uh, and the problem is that in, just between Earth and Mars, when we're closest together, we're 35 million miles apart. And it takes three and a half minutes at the speed of light for a radio signal to go that distance. When we're farthest apart, we're 235 million miles apart, and that takes 20 minutes one way for a radio signal at the speed of light. So you can imagine TCP flow control. You know, it says stop, and the guy on the other end doesn't hear you for 20 minutes, and he's pumping away, and the packets are flying down all over the floor. It doesn't work. The other problem we ran into very quickly is this thing called celestial motion. You know, the planets have this annoying habit of rotating, and you know, we haven't figured out what to do about that. So if you're talking to something on the surface, and it just rotates away, and you can't talk to it for a while until it comes back around again. So this is very disruptive, and it's very delayed. So in the end, we said, okay, we need to build a new set of protocols that behave more like email. Because when you send an email, you don't know if the other party is online or not. You don't care. It sort of hops through the net, and then waits until the guy on the other end says, hi, I'm here. I'll take the message now. So we developed something called the Bumble Protocol, which is a, a class of delay and disruption tolerant networking protocol. Uh, we built that, we iterated on it for a while. Um, then we actually went to uh, the uh, Defense Department, which had funded the original ARPANET, the Internet, and even the interplanetary architecture. And we said, we think you have a problem with terrestrial uh, tactical mobile communication that needs something other than TCP IP. Because in that environment, it's also very uh, disruptive, very hostile. People are jamming things. You're in radio shadow hiding from people shooting at you. So uh, we said, they said, well, that's an interesting idea. Prove it. And we said, OK. We built, uh, a, in parallel, we built a TCP IP system and a DTN, Delay and Disruption Tolerant Networking System. And we tested it with the Marine Corps at Fort AP Hill uh, in Virginia 
last uh, November. And we got 10 to 15 times more data through the DTN design than we did through the TCP IP design. And so the Marine Corps liked that. They thought that was, you know, a, a significant improvement. So they took all of the experimental gear with them. Uh, and I said, wait, it's an experiment. And they said, no, it isn't. Then off they went. <laughs> so we had to go get some more experimental gear because they took ours and used it. Um, so the, uh, we were also testing this uh, in another civilian application. You know the Sami, the reindeer herders that are way up in the north of Sweden and Finland and uh, Russia? Uh, they're so far north that satellite communication isn't very good for uh, connectivity because the antennas are right there on the, on the horizon trying to talk to a synchronous satellite. So we put, uh, two summers ago, we put a hotspot in one of the villages and we outfitted an all-terrain vehicle with a laptop. And we had it running the DTN protocols and it wandered into the village and dumped its data and picked up whatever it had and wandered out again. It was like a data mule and it worked. So this summer we did it with three villages. And so at this point, we're feeling pretty confident that these are robust protocols for these more uh, hostile conditions. And we're about to do something this month, which is straight out of science fiction for me anyway. We got permission from NASA to upload our new DTN protocols to the deep impact spacecraft, the one that's in uh, orbit around the sun that visited a comet and shot a probe in there to find out you know, what was the interior like. Well, the probe is gone, but the platform is still there, and, and it's coming back towards Earth right now. So we're going to uh, upload the protocols at the end of this month. We're going to run tests. And it's about 81 light seconds away, so it'll be 162 light seconds back and forth. We'll run those tests uh, uh, over a period of uh, a month or two uh, in October and November. And then in January, we're going to upload the protocols to the International Space Station, and we'll have them on board for a year. So we're going to be running these tests and demonstrations and validations. At the end of 2009, if the um, tests go well, NASA would, that would qualify us for what's called TRL Level 8, I mean Technology Readiness Level 8. That means they are deployable. They can be used in real space missions. So we've already talked to the Consultative Committee on Space Data Systems, and they are showing a lot of interest in using this as a standard. The whole idea here is that every time we launch a mission, if we use the standard protocols, then all of the equipment will be interoperable. So when you plug into the internet today, you can talk to those 542 million other things because of the standards. What we'd like is that for all the spacefaring nations to be able to make use of each other's uh, satellite capabilities or uh, uh, spacecraft capabilities, especially after they've completed their missions and could be repurposed. So our prediction is that over time, we'll accrete a, an interplanetary backbone to support manned and robotic exploration. So we're not trying to build this big backbone and hope somebody will come. That's not the idea. It's just that we want to be there with the protocols as new missions get launched and we'll grow this backbone as time goes on. Okay, well, let, let me stop there and I, let me thank you very much for letting me interrupt your day. I do look forward to having some Q&A as well. Thanks very much. Some time. Okay, well, thank you very much for the informative and entertaining uh, talk. And oh, sorry, that's me. Ah, I, GSM. <laughs> Let's go, Julian, and then Dave, and the moderator. Oh, sorry, I'm trying to turn my uh, thing off. Okay. No, it's actually <laughs> Wow. It's not. <laughs> okay. All right. Is that better? Um, it, it's not just implementation. Uh, the protocols have to change in order to do some of the things that I was mentioning. Broadcast, for example, there is no protocol. Not even, multi, not even multicast is quite designed to actually take advantage of a real broadcast medium. The mobility problem is quite real. Um, what we don't have is an endpoint identifier that can be fixed. Even if you move to different places in the internet and your IP address has changed, the mistake I made was to bind the TCP and UDP layer too tightly to IP. And as a result, when you move to a different termination point, 
uh, you break the connection. What I'd like is to maintain the connection and have a rebinding protocol that is strongly authenticated. So the notion here is that if you move to another uh, connection in the internet and you still have your endpoint identifier, you could say, hi, it's me again. I'm on a different IP address. The other guy can say, well, I'm not sure I believe you. Here's a random number. Please encrypt it using your private key and I will check it with the public key. So it, what I'm imagining is that there are some fairly straightforward new kinds of protocols that you could introduce that would give more flexibility to the system. How do we convince the commercial internet to experiment with research and proven protocols? I'm sorry, say again? How do we convince the commercial internet to experiment with research protocols? Oh, you don't have to because uh, what you do is you develop the protocols in laboratory settings. By the way, these protocols are implementable uh, as long as you still have IP which is what basically you're supposed to be able to get to. As long as you have just IP connectivity, everything that I have said is, is implementable without changing the underlying networks. The broadcast case, it would have to be new, right? The normal internet doesn't work with broadcast at all. So if you're in a broadcast meeting, you're free to do you know, whatever protocol experimentation you want. My experience is that as long as you're not doing something to the IP layer, you can try a whole lot of new things out, even on the public network. But for some of this work, you can do the original design and testing in a lab, you know, or in a segregated network. So the stuff that works somehow finds its way into the uh, commercial system. Um, yes, sir. Thanks for the talk. It was great. I love it. Second time I've seen it in a week. It gets better every time. It gets better every time. <laughs> Thank you for not falling asleep and snoring. Yes, that's right. And yeah. it's like something like two years, something like that. And I don't know how long you stayed at Panama, but you, what you would have realized, or what I'm sure you realized, is that, there's, that the basically not the application layer people or anything else, but the infrastructure people are basically panicking right now. And are they are they panicking in the sense that they know that there's a problem and they don't yeah, know what they to they do? Know, they're very vulnerable. And so the, the people are panicking out there right now is because IP6 hasn't been deployed in any meaningful. Now what's happening is people are, are, and we saw this at NAMI, all week was about this basically. Um, people are proposing things like, uh, like you know, Shin uh, NTP is proposing carrier grade map. Oh, I know. It's, this Randy, is horrible. Randy, Randy and his colleagues yeah. at A plus B, I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah. Um, uh, Alan at Elaine at AT&T. Yeah. No, isn't he at Comcast? Uh, Comcast, sorry. He's at Comcast. Yeah. Yes, I saw yeah, his. He has another NAT related. He has the uh, dual stack light proposal. Yeah. And what yeah. these things are, are all hacks. They're, They're all hacks. hacks. I but agree. I personally, I feel like this is life threatening in some ways for the internet as we know. Well, it could be very fragmenting in yeah. particular. Well, that's what I mean. Yeah. The end to end world yeah. is yeah. rapidly, mm -hmm. you know, things are happening. And this is probably, um, for people who aren't in the infrastructure piece of it, it's probably not visible, but I know you are. And I would like to know what you think is going to happen out here because I'll just, I'll give you my, my prediction. This stuff is all going to get deployed. It will, because, because of the economics of the situation and because of the people who are involved, that stuff can be deployed more rapidly than IPv6. So I, let, me, let me stop you there for a moment and, and let's arm wrestle about that. Uh, at Google, sorry about that. At Google, we started implementing IPv6 at the end of January this year. By this time, we have flushed out most of the problems that, uh, that, we have, uh, that we can uh, running IPv6. Now, it did not take us a huge amount of time to actually do that. The software is there. It's sitting in the, and this, this device here, that little uh, Macintosh laptop, nice, you've got an Air Mac there, I think. Um, if you, you can configure that with IPv6 by just clicking on that one little box, and it works. It worked, and, you know, as soon as I turned it on, it worked in our, in our environment. Um, the routers, for the most part, have IPv6 in them. So the real question from my point of view is, I don't deny that learning how to do it is going to take some work, 
because it took us some work too. Well, learning the, and maturing the network management system is going to take some work. But don't you think that these other hacks are going to turn out to be as difficult or more difficult to manage than simply rolling out IPv6? It seems to me that people are fooling themselves if they think that by putting these various hacks together that will somehow be easier or faster. I think it's going to be broken. So how do we convince people of that other than, for example, tactically, uh, I was told if some big company that was visible adopted IPv6 and started implementing it, it might persuade the ISPs that they should start running it. So I beat the living crap out of a bunch of engineers and we did it. We've implemented IPv6. So my question to the ISPs is, where the hell are you? <laughs> or WTF or something. You know. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> So, I, you know, I, I'm serious. I think that if a number of uh, larger uh, internet service providers or internet application providers started asking the ISPs, where's my IPv6, that maybe we'd make some progress. I do accept your point, though, that there's a lot of panic out there. There's another... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. What I'm curious to know is that as we go forward, do you think the same principle would allow us to scale the internet further? And then if that is true, uh, that sort of seems to motivate the idea of, well, there is a networking issue of how to do routing and things related to the core of the internet that uh, some companies like Cisco do. And there are services or end-to-end -end issues that some people, will, some companies that provide services, maybe like Google, for example. And now you see that there is a cross interest between these companies, you know, they sort of venture in each other's area, which is fine as far as business, but I want to know if, um, how does it sit with the sort of an end to an argument that there is sort of a clean and I think meaningful separation between these two worlds? Yeah, so okay. This. So on, the, on purely technical grounds, I think the separation is still there. Uh, the layers are still there. The place where there's a conflict is when uh, an application provider is also providing the underlying transport and decides that it wants to take advantage of the fact that it's providing the underlying transport to advantage its applications and disadvantage competing applications. So if there is a, a conflict at all, I don't think it's a technological one. I think it's a business conflict. I think it's a regulatory conflict. And uh, many of you have heard uh, of the term net neutrality. It's been distorted very badly in some of the, you know, to turn in, it turned into a kind of a bumper sticker exchange. But uh, the real answer is that in places where strong regulation insists that there is broadband wholesale access to the underlying basic IP switching service, uh, there has been a very robust competition for application. Uh, BT, British Telecom, is required by Ofcom to offer a, a, a um, broadband wholesale service and it's separated from the rest of the application services that BT offers. And I talked to them just a couple of weeks ago and it's turned out to be a good business for them. So the, the, the frequent myth is, oh, we can't make any money at wholesale and, you know, it'll destroy our business. We, are, we have worked examples where that's not the case. In Japan, that's not the case. NTT provides wholesale broadband facilities and other people provide applications. And so do they, but they're segregated. So my uh, honest belief right now is that by keeping the services segregated, either physically separate businesses or at least by accounting practices, uh, it's possible to have competition at the higher level while accepting the point that often you won't have much competition at the basic carriage level. I mean, how much competition is there for broadband in the United States? Well, you get a choice sometimes of nothing if you're in the rural part of Oregon. There's no broadband at all. Uh, you might get a, common, a uh, cable carrier or maybe a DSL a telco. Sometimes you get both, but not always. It's a very, very little competition. You don't see people rushing to put in another broadband alternative channel. And my view is that that's not enough competition to discipline the market using conventional competition, and therefore you need strong regulation. And that's how I would solve that problem. I, we are really, are we, are we running short? Are we okay? All right. 
We can do one more. There was a. Um, but you had your hand up too. Yeah. And then the question about <coughs> one of the things that seems to me very likely is that the B4 world, as it moves into this much more broker gateway translation world, referring back to your earlier slide, drives some of those other billions, the Chinese and whatever, into a position of advantage. If I was the Chinese, and I know from their academic networks now, I would be moving full on into the B6 world and not worrying so much about that mostly English mostly legacy holder before based world and much more approaching a, a full end to end B6 world. Well, it's possible. Uh, you know, what this reminds me of is uh, what happened with American television, right? We deployed television before everybody else, so we got NTSC with 525 lines, and the Europeans did it later, and so their PAL system produced 625 lines, and their TVs looked better. Um, the Chinese have said that they want to move to IPv6 for obvious reasons. They could, they could, they could themselves easily use up all of the IPv4 address space uh, if they wanted to. So um, that's their stated goal. I wish that we could uh, take the, uh, the panic that uh, we referred to earlier and somehow turn that into some constructive and positive progress. Uh, but I think that our businesses will be weakened if the only way we can reach everyone else is through all these brokered mechanisms, remember the statistics that, uh, that you were implicitly referring to. We are a tiny, we, the United States, are a tiny part of the Internet world right now. How are, uh, at Google, for example, more than half of our income comes from outside the United States now. And so we care a great deal about being able to serve the rest of the world. And, and, and you know, it's not that we're, we, don't, we don't want to abandon the United States, it's a huge piece of our revenue, but we, I would be unhappy if we were forced to do some strange thing in the United States to reach the customers and then do some straightforward end-to-end -end thing for the rest of the world. But as you say, it's a potential outcome. Not good for either our business or for a lot of other people. Okay, we have time, I think, for one more, and then we need to... One more. One more, yeah. Gentlemen at the back. Well, I want to go back to Dave's point about uh, V6 and deployment challenges. I mean, and, and Google sees it themselves. I mean, yes, I can point to if I boot up my Mac on a campus network, I can uh, go to ipv6.google.com and mm -hmm. see that works. But what I can't do is I can't go www.google.com and get to you via V6 data way because you're not yet advertising quad A records. I mean, so well, with, the disconnected, the, with the disconnected internet, yes. you know. Oh, no, no, I understand. It's, it's a, a critical mass issue. Yeah, there's, there's no question about that. And there's also no question that if you're going to be an IPv6 only guy, you need to have a way to get to the rest of the IPv4 world because they're not all going to be running parallel stack at the same time. So I, we are going to be faced, whether we like it or not, with various kinds of brokered interfaces and NAT like functions. I think that's in, inescapable. Um, if you're interested in service, though, you should be implementing parallel now. And in the case of www.google.com, we will get to v4 and v6 on both of those. It's just that we did it the other way during this uh, period of development time so that we didn't accidentally mess up everyone else in the world using uh, Google services. But that was a conscious decision. We do intend to move to dual, um, uh, dual response in the DNS. Okay, I guess that's really all the time we have. Thank but thanks again.